Hi, uh, my name is Clint Hunker, and I'm an artist. I've worked in watercolor for many years. I'm also a teacher, an art teacher at the University of Saskatchewan and at St. Peter's College in Munster. So I am going to give you a, a brief demonstration and a very basic demonstration about how you can work with and apply watercolor. And I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about the materials that you're going to need. Now you can get any of the materials that you need for under $25 if you want to uh, just experiment uh, and try them out. You can go with cheaper uh, materials but what I recommend is that you go to a student grade uh, materials list after that. The reason being that the brushes, the paper, and the pigments are just that much better. You'll get better results right away. So let's talk a little bit about brushes to begin with. So you don't need a lot of brushes, but the best brushes are made out of sable. And sable is a, a kind of a squirrel uh, famous to Russia especially. So this one is a Kalinsky sable brush. And the reason that you uh, will eventually want to go with a sable brush is this. When I put this brush in the water and I form a point, I can then dip it into the paint And I can create a wash, and this brush will hold that paint without a lot of drip. Now, you're probably going to start with a synthetic nylon brush that looks something like this. And it will work, but what it will do is it will eventually start to, to drip. It holds less of the paint in the fibers of the, in the hairs of the brush. So this is supposed to hold two-thirds of its weight in paint once it's, it's dipped in. So what I recommend is that first off you get yourself a number eight nylon round or tipped brush. This brush is called a number 12. So you're going to get one that's more like this, slightly smaller. Okay, but you're going to get the nylon one. It'll do you for a while. The second thing that you want to get is a squirrel flood brush. So this is made out of squirrel hairs and you'll notice it's flat and rounded. And it's for doing things like laying down wash, uh, clear water that you're going to work into. It's also a good thing for uh, flooding large areas. And then this little guy that I've got here, this is called a scripting brush and again it's made out of hog's hair or sorry it's made out of sable and so this is for getting a nice thin line okay so that's those and let's talk about paper well the best watercolor paper is made out of cotton rag and it comes in a variety of weights so you'll go into an art supply store and you will see a 60 pound, 90 pound, 300 pound paper. And what you want to do is you want to get yourself a thin paper, but hopefully it's going to be made out of cotton, cotton rag. So here I have a sheet of Saunders 200 pound paper, and I'm going to get this ready for uh, us to use. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to tear it. So you see I fold it right over, keeping it square. And I just fold that edge. And I crease that edge with my nail or you could use even a screwdriver. And then I'm going to turn it backwards. 
and I'm going to do the same thing. Okay, that looks pretty good. And now I'm going to separate it with my hands. Can't be too cautious with it. It won't rip on you. Okay, so here we have a piece. And people often ask me, well, which is the right side? And the truth is that you could work on either side of this paper perfectly well. But one side, if you were to look really carefully, you will see a small screen uh, sort of imprint on the paper, and that's the back. So here I look at this and I see a pebbled surface, so this is the one we're going to use. I'll just get rid of a little bit more. Just want to make sure I got that right. Like this. So here I have a couple scraps, but um, I just wanted to point one thing out. Traditionally, the paper would have been stretched with brown butcher tape. So this is old-fashioned brown butcher tape that's been laid down on the edges. The paper is wet first. You actually soak the paper, lay it down on the board, and then you stretch it with this butcher tape. When the uh, paper dries, it goes taut. And if you're using a birch panel like this, you're going to end up with a slight bit of a wow in the board. And that wow creates an air space between the paper and the board. So that people like that because it feels like they're working on canvas. So this might be a little too heavy to do that, but we'll, I'm going to stretch this out the old-fashioned way with masking tape. So I'm just going to stretch it over so that I've got about a half of an inch over top of the paper. And of course, if you wanted to be really careful, you could measure uh, in and make sure that your tape is, is absolutely square. It's always a good thing to do. Okay, so that's set. Now, I'll just show you this uh, watercolor here. Uh, this is a, a discard, okay, of one that I did out on site at, in winter. But I just want to point out on this out that this is not stretched. So this piece of paper is 300 pound, and you can see it's like cardboard. When you get it that heavy, you can just work on the paper as much as you want. You don't have to stretch it at all. Okay, so let's see what I've forgotten so far in my notes. A lot of people ask me about palettes and there's a number of different palettes that you can get. I really like working with these little dishes. Uh, they have little areas that you can mix up a number of individual colors with. So they work really well. Here's a little traveling uh, palette that I took uh, to Europe with me, and it worked pretty good. Uh, maybe not quite enough, enough space, but you still have enough area to wipe. Uh, you know, if you wipe it clean, you have enough area that you can build up some nice washes 
And the idea is you want to get a pool of wash, um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Let's look at, for just a second at these three watercolors I've got in the back of me here. So the first one I'd like to talk about is this little painting by Robert Hurley. So he was a Saskatchewan watercolor painter and he died in the 1980s. And he came from England where he saw all sorts of famous paintings by people like Turner, those kinds of guys. When you look at this, this way of painting that he learned, I would call that the British watercolor tradition. And what that means is that he lays down a wash and then he'll let it dry and he'll allow another wash to go over top and then maybe a third wash. So if you're looking at these little parts, you can see that the little uh, thatches of grass are put in on top of a very faded green. And this yellow was toned down by a little bit of brown. So this way is the English or the British watercolor tradition. He was so poor that he often used berry juice, Saskatoons and pin cherries, those kinds of juices for his reds. Coming along here, now this is a painting, a little study of a hibiscus by the artist Lorna Russell. And so she's incorporating some of the techniques that Hurley uses, but she's got her own way of doing it. So she's having little tiny bits of bleed that happen in areas there. And each one of these may be just a single wash, or she may be laying uh, one color on top of another. And then this one is another painting by Lorna Russell. And this is a fairly contemporary uh, one from 2007. And here she's given up that technique and she's just laying in bright planes of individual color, each with a little uh, space around it. So they're like cells that are coming together. Nice bright color. She didn't have to load it up one on top of the other. The British watercolor tradition relies upon the fact that watercolor is always a transparent medium. And you don't mix the paint up to the thickness that you can't see the paper underneath. And you don't use a lot of white to make the paint opaque. You keep it transparent. So here I am going to start with one of our first exercises. Okay, so I'm going to draw to begin with, I'm going to draw several circles. And I'm just doing this because this is an easy way to uh, to delineate the shape. Okay. So, when you're working with watercolor, Lots of people like to work flat, some people like to work vertically, and some people like to work, like Hurley would have, at a, about a 30 degree angle. So a little bit more than that, maybe. Here, we'll use this eraser. That's better. So that the paint is going to drift down a little bit. So. This is the method that you would learn if you were going to the Hallmark greeting card school. I think it's in Chicago. And they would be very, very specific about teaching you to be accurate and careful. So here I have my circle and I'm going to mix up a wash. Enough that it's going to do the whole circle. And what I'm going to create here is an even flood. I'm going to attempt to do this. What I want is for the, the wash to be the same here as it is here. No blips, no little brush marks. 
just as if you were to uh, put a layer of saran wrap in that color over top of the thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this one by filling this area in the upper quadrant with enough, hopefully enough pigment that I can carry it up and down. Okay, that might do, it might not. So my next step is, I don't want to go in like this and try and create the edge. So I sneak up to the edge with the brush. And this is where a nice tipped brush really helps. And then I sculpt, almost sculpt around the edge of the line of the circle. Moving the wash down. So again, this is a, a technique that you can practice. And once you're good at it, you can forget about it and do something else. You don't have to do watercolor this way. So now I'm going down. Good enough. Okay, I'm going to do this on purpose. Okay, so I've got extra paint on there. What I want to do now is I want to milk that paint off of the image. Because in these parts here, it's going to be too dark. So I've blotted my brush, and then I just pick it up. in a few spots. There. Now that's about as good as I can get it for now. A little bit of a problem there. But that's not too bad, considering that this paper has a slight texture to it. Okay, we're going to let that dry. And now I'm going to do another one. Let's do this one in purple. Well, that looks okay. So, sometimes you will hear that you're supposed to wet the paper first. So in this case, I'm going to do that. Some people believe that it, take, it makes a more even wash if the paper is wet. So I'm going to do exactly the same thing with the squirrel brush. I think that's okay. So now that's going to dry a little bit. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a piece of paper toweling, blot it, pick up the excess, and now I'll go in with the violet. And again, I'm going to put it in the upper quadrant in the center. And then I'm going to bring it up. Good. Okay, again, I'll get rid of that excess.
Not too bad. Okay. Is this guy dry? Nope. Okay, so now I'm just going to draw a square. There's that pencil. Okay, so I'm going to do a, what's called a graduated wash now. And to do that, I'm going to take the squirrel brush. Here she is. And I'm going to flood this thing. And just for the heck of it, we won't blot it, okay? So I'm going to do this with ultramarine blue, but what's going to happen is it's going to start out brighter, and hopefully it's going to end up very pale at the bottom. So that means that I want to take the blue and make it really intense, and I want to lay that across the top. As soon as you start working wet into wet, which is what's happening right now, the paint begins to fuzz out and you lose the intensity of the color that you're using. So you notice that went pale pretty quick, so I'm going to reload this. Okay, and now I'm just going to add water. Now I'm going to fiddle with it, because obviously this is okay, but it's not that successful. So I'm going to take a little bit more blue. I'll keep my brush fairly dry at this point now. Okay, that's not too bad. So now I'm going to start to remove wherever I think it's a little bit too dark. And maybe add a little bit too. It's good enough for me. All right, so we're going to let that one dry. That's called a graduated wash. And a great exercise, if you're trying to learn to do this, is to make a fairly big one, six inches square. Try doing it several times. And then try flipping it. So the light area... Put a different color in a bright form over top and go graduate it down to the top. So what happens... Are you dry? Yep. What happens uh, when you start laying layers of color one on top of another? Well, the first thing that happens is, of course, the hues, they're different than if you were to mix them together. For instance, if I was to take the blue and the purple, mix them together, and put down a single wash, it would look different than if I put 
a purple on top of a blue and allow that slight separation to occur between the areas. It would create more luminosity in the watercolor. So that's what I'm going to do right now. But I think I'll use... Oh dear. I'm going to use this violet here. This is a different violet. So this is a, a very light cobalt violet rose, they call it. So I'm going to do exactly the same thing. I'm going to lay it on. Okay, so that's that's good for me, but some people would say that that's got too much variety, right? That you want a cleaner wash, a crisper wash. So how would you deal with that? Well, the first thing that would give you a cleaner, crisper wash is if you work with a paper that's smooth. This paper having a little bit of texture, it creates this nice organic quality on the surface. But uh, if you don't want that, you want clarity, then you would lay it on a smoother paper and then you would do this. You'd flood this second one here. We're actually going to get rid of it. So I'm going to slightly scrub it. just with my brush and then I'm going to take the paper and I'm going to blot it. See the difference? So I've lightened the whole thing. I've also, in theory, I've gotten rid of all of the little bits of nuance that actually make it more interesting. Yeah. Okay, and then if you wanted to do another coat of clear water, clear water also settles down the surface so that there's less uh, nuance. But now I'm going to lay a little bit of Viridian, which is a kind of green. Where are you, Viridian? Well, we'll use this guy. I'm going to lay a little bit of this on top. But I'm going to graduate it and see if I can make the thing feel like it's a bit of a, a ball. You can never really get rid of watercolor once it's been put down. You can lighten it, you can scratch it off, but the pigment stains the paper, so it goes into the paper, and that means that really it's not conducive to total removal. You just learn to live with that. It's one of the, the beauties of the, of the material. Okay, so I'm getting a bit of a f feeling that this is three-dimensional at this point. So... While these are drying,
we'll try a reverse on this. So I'm turning it over. And I'm going to make something really ugly here. No, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something that's impossible. I'm going to put yellow on there. So this is going to be bright, and this is going to be faint. Yellow on top of blue, because they are two primaries. If you mix them together, you get green. Okay. Oh, not too bad. Oop, got a little bit of a run down there. So you change the hue, you change the color by putting something on top of it. But the other thing to remember is that every time you put another layer of wash on top of another layer of wash, the painting gets darker. And so at a, so at a certain point, it begins to look a little bit muddy. You've got to keep the colors kind of nice and fresh. I'll let this guy go. Okay, so taking the second ball, I'm now going to draw a circle within it. And what we're going to do with that circle is we're going to take a little bit of Chinese white. It's a one, it's a sort of a semi-transparent or semi-opaque pigment that you can use in watercolor. So I have a little bit there. I hope this works. Okay, so now I'm just going to fill this in. just to give you an idea of what the white does. Oh, that's not done. Oh, got lots of bleeding happening. Okay, so we'll just let that dry. Now, another thing that I wanted to show you is the whole idea of, okay, this is a more advanced exercise. So here I have a couple of leaves. And I'm going to just trace around this leaf in the same way that I did with this with the balls There. So it's just an outline. So I'd like you to think about this leaf 
And I'd like you to think about, well, what are the colors in there? But specifically, what are the colors that are underneath? The colors that are on top? Because this leaf was dark green at one point, now it's changed. So when I look at this, the first thing I see is that there's a little tiny bit of that green still left. Sort of, it's an undercurrent in the leaf. And then on top of that, I see a kind of a, what I would call a yellow ochre, an earth tone. So, I'm going to put as my first layer, very lightly and generally, I'm not going to look at any detail or anything, I'm just going to take a little bit of this yellow ochre and I'm going to kick it back a little bit. That means I'm going to subdue it or make it less bright. So I'm going to add a tiny little bit of violet to it. Yellow ochre and violet are kind of like complements of one another, so they cancel one another out. I don't know if that's good enough. Okay. So, yeah, just do the whole thing. Now, I'm going to keep it wet, and instead of laying it with another layer, the next layer I'm going to use is going to be dropped wet into wet. So I'm going to think about that red in there, and I see that in little parts, the red is brighter than the wine on the top. So I'm going to take some of my red, which I don't seem to see. I'll have to get some. So I'm going to take a little bit of a color called Carmen, which is like a good watercolor paint called uh, color called alizarin crimson. You might have heard of it if you've worked in oil or acrylic. It's a it's kind of a purpley blue red. Now I'm also going to take some of that. I'm going to put a little bit more yellow ochre into it. And I'm going to stick in some blue green. See what happens? Darkens it. Okay, so I'm going to start off. by just dropping this color in. To different spots. And let's do this. Some orange. Now I'm going to take the dark.
There, that's the color I was looking for. What I really need is some Viridian at this point. It's a green. So you can see that I'm getting close in value and in color to the leaf as it is. But now I'm going to add this uh, little bit of paint here is Viridian green. And it's a blue-green, transparent. And I'm just taking it off of the tube. And I'm mixing it into the purple or sorry, into the, the carmine color. So red into green, they're complements. So they cancel one another out. And as they cancel one another out, they become darker. All right, so this is the point at which I would have to leave this to dry. Because I've kind of got the base coat uh, built up. And in order to lay in things like the, uh, you know, the leaf veins and the little parts, the little differences, I would probably work into them dry as opposed to wet into wet. So at this point, I would leave it. Um, I think that's all I wanted to tell you about. This is a really good exercise. I've given this to students a lot and they seem to really learn a lot about how to combine color uh, in order to get the paint bright enough and dark enough and rich enough uh, to really make watercolor work and sing. So a good exercise. Remember that you don't have to lay wash upon wash upon wash. You can go in and be much more immediate with watercolor and experimental. But another one that you could practice if you're wanting to learn that traditional method is you could take a piece of cloth, patterned cloth. This one looks good here. And do the same thing that, uh, that you did to the leaf with this piece of cloth. Draw it out, begin with a base color, maybe in sienna or uh, yellow ochre, one color, and then gradually start building up. And in this way you learn to work from the general to the specific, which means that the big shapes and the pattern are down first, but the specifics, the bits of detail, they come at the very end. So that's also a good exercise to practice.